And we're back. Uh, this should be, let's see, this is part two, if you count the introduction, I guess it's part three. Uh, this one will be much shorter, and the last ones will be much shorter than the one before this. Uh, by the way, this is really freaking weird, standing here by myself. I thought about changing clothes or something, so it seemed a little different, but hey, things are going well. Hopefully you haven't slept yet. Um, but what we're going to look at this one is invention and innovation, and we're going to talk a little bit about light bulbs, we're going to talk a little bit about telephones, yes, that's telephone and some of the new kind of cool things at that time period in history that made life a little bit more similar to what we see today. And we're going to focus a lot early on communication. And I bet a lot of you guys don't know what that is because you don't have one in your house and you don't care. Um, but the problem with our country at this point is we've become really good at some things. We'd figured out the steel problem. We had oil. Uh, we, we, had the train going, you could get across the country in a small amount of time. We could make goods really quickly using Henry Ford's assembly line that you learned about in the last video. But we lacked in rapid communication. It still took months to get a letter across the country. I know you're going to say, but the Pony Express, not as big a deal as you were told it is. But we didn't have email. We didn't have internet. We didn't have those things that we're used to now. We had the telegraph. And I don't know if you guys know about this, but it uh, uses Morse code because it was invented by Samuel F.B. Morris. And it's a language that uses dots and dashes in order to send messages. So if you can imagine, if you wanted to send, uh, I don't know, a love note to somebody instead of sending a Snapchat or an email or a mind message or whatever the heck you guys do now, um, what you would do instead is you would have to go to a telegraph office and hand this thing that you had written to somebody, and they would dee 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 a little message in, so they got to read your message, and then it went to whatever town your little love life person was in, and the person received it and was dee 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 again dancing, and they would get to read it, and then they would deliver it to your love interest, and so now like four people have read it, everybody knows your business, and it took a while, and you had to pay to send it, and they had to pay to receive it, it seems kind of stupid, and it still took a long time. The big company at that time that did this was called Western Union. Western Union owned all the telegraph lines in the country, but for some reason the government thought that was okay, so Western Union kind of took advantage of that. An inventor named Cyrus Field figured out a way that we could communicate with Europe using this called the transatlantic cable. They actually took a telegraph cable and dumped it in the Atlantic Ocean, like from New York under the sea, all the way to England, and then we could send telegraph messages to Europe, and everyone could read them. But obviously there's got to be a better way. All right, so that sucks. Okay, so along comes in 1876 Alexander Graham Bell. Now Alexander Graham Bell was a teacher of the deaf. And uh, some people say that when Bell invented the telephone, what he was really trying to do was he was trying to invent a hearing aid because he was in love with a deaf girl. See, every great story starts with a love thing. Um, but realistically, what he did is he invented the telephone, which you guys now refuse to talk on because there's a better way to do things. Uh, when he tried to sell it to people, though, they didn't like the idea because as they said it was just a fad. That no one would be interested in owning one. There was probably only a need for a few of them in the entire world. Uh, Western Union themselves even said no one will want one of these. Obviously the phone did quite well if we count the number of them that are probably in a classroom or in your house right now. You know that there's more than just a fad. So by 1895, about 20 years later, there are a hundred different phone companies in the United States and they combine to call themselves the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Now, if you look real close, you're going to see it. But if you don't see it, it's right there, AT&T, one of the first major phone companies. Um, now, here you've got kind of the setup of how the phone worked. You've got an entity you were talking to. It's kind of big and kind of annoying. Then you have a piece you had to put up by your ear. We figured out a way to go small and put them by our heads. And there was some big battery. I don't understand why that worked or how that worked. I've never seen one like that before. Now. The icon when it comes to invention is Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison um, is responsible for a lot of inventions. I'm going to get a little bit into some controversy with Thomas Edison in a minute. Uh, you almost always see Thomas Edison as like this old guy, but obviously he was a young guy and a middle-aged guy, and he did a lot of really cool things in his life. Now, I have to give you the Edison disclaimer first. Um, I get it. I know Edison might not have invented all this stuff. He was pretty smart, and if you went to work for Edison, he made you sign something that said that anything that you invented was his intellectual property while you were working with him. If you know anything about this, you may know Tim Burton, who did The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, before he made The Nightmare Before Christmas, he worked for Disney. Disney makes you sign an intellectual property contract 
This is any idea that you come up with while you're working for Disney belongs to Disney. Edison did that with his workers. And so Edison gets credited for about 1,000 patents. It's actually like 1,200 and something. But we don't actually know how many of them he invented and how many of his workers did. Regardless, he gets the credit. He has the patents. He got a lot of the money. And so he's the man. Um, now, he's known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. Menlo Park being a place where he set up his research lab in New Jersey. Wizard because he did things people didn't think were possible. Some of his major inventions, he made the... the not the first, please don't get, it, get me wrong and think it was the first one, but he made kind of the longest lasting incandescent light bulb of that time. Something you screwed into the socket and, and it worked and you could light a room for a few hours before it went dead. Um, he also invented all the power stations and dynamos to get that going. He, he ran the first Edison General Electric, which then dropped his name and became General Electric or GE. He also invents the phonograph, a way to record music and play it back. That one gets creepily used in the first talking dog, a doll's talking dog, because that would be something totally different. Uh, what's the dog from Up? I can't remember his name. He's awesome, though. It's like, look, a squirrel. And I just looked a squirrel in the video. Um, but the phonograph was a way to play music for people, and um, you could record music the way that we do now. Imagine there not being record players or 8-tracks or CDs or MP3s without this idea coming first. And this is actually one of those, one of those machines. He also involves in, invents the kinetoscope. Kinetic means moving, scope being camera. It's a moving camera, so like this, hi. This camera now is recording my movement, my voice. This could record movement. They hadn't got to the point of recording voice yet. They'll figure that out for a little, bit while, a little while. He also makes some of the first movies. There's one of the little cats boxing each other. It's pretty funny. No animals were harmed in the making of that film. Um, first monster movie, Frankenstein, that's him. And he makes improvements to the telephone, probably the biggest one. Alexander Graham Bell liked the boats. He liked sailing. And so Alexander Graham Bell thought that people should answer their phones by saying, ahoy. Thomas Edison gets credit for convincing people to use the word hello, thank God, because I think saying ahoy would be lame. Um, he then invents a lot of other things, an electric motor, an electric canoe, talking dolls, a concrete house, uh, all kinds of stuff. I don't even, you don't even need to know. It's just, the talking dolls were really creepy. There you go. And he's famous for a couple of really big time quotes. Uh, first one is, sticking to it is a genius. If at first you don't succeed, try try again. That's the idea. And then also, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So you don't have to be a super smart dude. As long as you're willing to work really hard, anyone can pass American history. There you go. Um, also, and you guys might like this, uh, he started putting together his movies and putting them in these things, these boxes where you could watch them. And they had these things that plugged in your ears. So I think Edison involved, invents the earbud. I'm pretty positive that's a thing. Uh, he played him at these new places called arcades. Now, um, some other major game changes at that time in history. The Wright brothers. You may have seen this first flight at Kitty Hawk. Um, Elisha Otis invents the elevator and the elevator brake. A man named Granville Woods not only invents the air brake that stops various things, but he also gets a system so the trolley cars could work on an electrified track. Suspension bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge were new. Skyscrapers like the Flatiron Building in New York City. Some others. This, one, this one's pretty cool. I know you can't see what it is probably, but this is Nikola Tesla. Uh, Tesla worked for Edison for a while. They did not get along well. Uh, Tesla was schizophrenic, and um, so he got taken advantage of quite a bit. Tesla did a number of things with electricity. Uh, and during the time of his death, he was working on something called the Tesla Death Ray. It's this big ball, and he shot lightning out at anything that moved. Kind of cool. Um, some of you guys might know this picture, and this is a big Wisconsin thing. This is um, H. H. Bennett, um, who did his work in the Dells. And what H. H. Bennett did is he invented the shutter for a camera. So when you take a picture, it snaps that moment, and you don't have to. People don't have to sit and smile for like a minute to get their picture taken. It can just be bang a moment in time. He improved on the idea that this guy came up with. This is Carl Eastman, who kind of made a better camera that used roll film, film that you could put in the camera, rather than having to put these giant plates in. And this right here is the first typewriter invented by a guy from Milwaukee named Christopher Latham Scholes. Now, some of the other innovations, there were a number of changes in retail at this time, or the way that we bought things. No Amazon.com yet, no Cyber Mondays or Black Fridays or Super Saturdays or get run over in a Walmart parking lot. Wednesday. I have no idea where that came from. Now, all this speed up in transportation and things like that makes the world a smaller place. 
So it used to be you shopped at your general store, you walked in and you were like, hey, I want chicken noodle soup, and if the woman that owned the store made chicken noodle soup, you could have some, but if she put carrots in it and you didn't like carrots, you were screwed. But all of this transportation and quick communication changes things to where things can be sent around the country faster and make things more available to more people. And so there's some changes in shopping. First idea is called the department store. Used to be that in order to put together this outfit, I would have to go to, uh, let's see, I bought deodorant, so I've got to go to a pharmacy. Um, I've got on a shirt, so I'd have to go to a tailor, because I would be dressed way nicer than this if I was alive back then. Um, I would have to go to a pants store. I'm wearing socks, so I would have to go to a sock store, shoe store, because they measure my feet and make me shoes. I'm kind of wearing my watch, so there's that. Jewelry store for my ring that I wear on my thumb. I think I told you guys that story. Um, yeah, there's another store for my underwear, but let's not go there. Uh, keys. I'm going to a lot of places to get what I'm wearing. But if you think about it, you can get all this stuff now. We have places called department stores where you can get hardware in one area and food in another and a towel and medicine and books. Places that have different departments. This was new because the idea that you could get everything in one place seems stupid to these people because why would you go to one store when there are specialists that could make these things better for you? They also started having chain stores, stores that exist in a number of different places. You can get the same McDonald's hamburger in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin that my parents can get in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that my aunt can get in Los Angeles, California, all the same. Things like that didn't exist back then because people couldn't be in more than one place to get something started. And also mail order catalogs. Imagine Amazon but on paper. The first mail order catalog was actually started by a guy named Aaron Montgomery Ward, but the one that became really popular was the Sears and Roebuck catalog. You could actually order a house out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog and it came with uh, directions on how to put it together. But you could order anything. You could order a horse, you could order a carriage, a piano, a baseball glove, 50 pounds of sugar if you wanted to. Think Amazon, but on paper. But then along with this, it starts to come brand names and names that we recognize and slogans and cans that we've seen before. All right, so brands become important because rather than buying Ma Seep's chicken noodle soup from the Seep Family General Store in Trigger, Wisconsin, you could buy Campbell's soup everywhere and it would be exactly the same and the can would look the same and you knew it was in it and you didn't have to worry about it. So slogans become a big deal. Think about some of the slogans that you guys know. Um, oh God, now I'm going to blank out. Let's see, mm -mm, good, let's see, choice of a new generation used to be Pepsi. There's tons of slogans. My, my kids used to sing the Union Cab song uh, from the radio, you know, and things like that all the time. Now, advertising becomes a big deal. Ads now on the internet, ads on YouTube videos, but imagine ads in newspapers and things like that. Um, jingles or little songs that went away with, along with things that you would see on the radio or hear things like, uh, let's see, the Union Cab song that my kids love. It's, let's see, <clears throat> if you need a Union Cab, call 242-2000, 242 you know you get the idea. And also labels. Now, this is not what a Campbell's soup can looks like now, but if I asked you to draw one, I'm sure you probably could. You all know what color a Pepsi can is. You all know what a Mountain Dew can is. If I put the Apple logo on the board, you guys would all know. These ideas were all new to get people to buy Campbell's rather than some other brand of soup. All right? Now, that's it for this section. It was pretty quick. I'll see you guys in the next one. We're almost done.